Hi, I'm Molly. Something terrible happened to me last year because of my best friend, Julie. It sounds crazy, but I was stuck at the bottom of the sea for 36 hours. Yes, at the bottom of the sea, underwater, for 36 hours, which is more than a day. You'll see that I'm not making it up when you hear my whole story. It all started when Julie showed me a photo. Molly, check this out. So I took her phone. Ethan, a guy that Julie met on Instagram, was holding the steering wheel of a boat and smiling. I never liked this guy, and this photo made me like him even less. It was so obvious that he was just a spoiled rich kid. So, I said, and gave the phone back to her. I could tell that she wanted something from me. He's inviting us to spend the weekend on his boat. I pretended not to understand. Us? How does he know me? He barely even knows you. You just message each other. She said, we talked on the phone for hours last night. Trust me, he's a great guy. Come on, let's go together. I immediately said, no way. What am I going to do on a boat with a total stranger for two days? So she said something she knew would work. What if he's a psycho? Are you going to leave me alone with a guy like that? This was the same sentence I used on her last month. I asked her to come with me when I was meeting a guy for the first time. So we went to the date together. She basically meant, now it's your turn. I had to say yes. On Saturday morning, we took a three-hour bus ride to the beach town where Ethan lived. He picked us up and drove us to the boat. It wasn't too big, but it was so luxurious. There were two cabins below deck. Julie and I took over the big one. Ethan didn't seem like such a bad guy. I thought maybe I was wrong about him. When we came back, we were surrounded by water already on our way. Ethan was steering the boat. Please don't get me wrong, but don't captains drive boats like these? I asked. He smiled. Don't worry, this is a small yacht. I have a license to drive it. Anyway, we're not going to drive all the time. We'll find a good spot and anchor there, he said. Julie and I sat down to relax in the sun. It wasn't hot enough to wear a bikini, but the sun was still pretty strong. Two or three hours later, we stopped. We anchored next to an island. Nobody lived on that part of the island, so it was just us, the sea, and nature. Ethan was a great host. He prepared all the food by himself. It felt like summer, even though it was the end of November. <laughs> Julie didn't drink much, but Ethan and I got so drunk we could barely speak. He stood up. Your captain's about to pass out. I need to go to bed. The boat needs me tomorrow, he said, and wobbled his way to his cabin. After a while, we went back to our cabin as well. I was a little dizzy and got frustrated with myself for having drunk so much. I remember my head touching the pillow and I dozed off immediately. The sea was so calm when we went to bed. I don't know when the weather worsened and a huge storm began, but when I woke up, the yacht was rocking a lot. I looked for Julie, but she wasn't in her bed. At first I thought I was dreaming, but of course I was not. I heard a pounding noise from below as if something was hitting the boat. With each hit, the boat would rise up and then quickly fall down. I knew it wasn't a good idea to go upstairs in such weather, but I had to find Julie. I tried to stand up, but it was impossible to stand on my feet. Just then, the boat swung hard. I tried to hold on to something, but I couldn't. I hit my back against the wall and screamed in pain. It hurt so much that I was sure I had broken something. The pain stopped after a while. I checked my arms, legs, and ribs. Nothing hurt, and I was relieved that nothing was broken. I suddenly realized the real danger. I was in a boat. There was a terrible storm outside, and boats tended to sink during storms. What was I supposed to do? Was I supposed to stay down here or try to go upstairs? I was thinking that the right thing to do was to go outside when the boat started to rock even more. It felt like the boat started moving. Had Ethan taken control of the boat? Were we going somewhere safe? I was trying to calm myself down when I heard a really loud noise. I realized that the movement was just due to the boat drifting and we had crashed against the rocks surrounding the island. It was now clear what was about to happen. The boat was going to sink. I managed to get up because the boat wasn't rocking as much. 
I was trying to get to the door when suddenly it split in two and water started pouring into the cabin. It was what I had been afraid of. We were sinking. The water was pouring in so fast that I couldn't move through it. I went to the bathroom and shut the door. I took the towels from the cabinet and stuffed them under the door, but the water kept coming in. Until then, I had managed to stay calm. But now I had enough reasons to panic. The boat I was in had hit a rock in a storm and was sinking quickly. And I was stuck inside a tiny bathroom. For the first time, I thought I might actually die. I started yelling to get this thought out of my mind. Molly, use your brain. Come on, you have to find a way to get out of here. Use your brain. The bathroom kept filling with water, which had by now reached my knees. I stood up on the toilet. It was impossible to get out of here. The water was going to fill up this tiny bathroom soon. I don't know how much time had passed. I had resigned myself to my fate and was just waiting. The water was now up to my chest. At this point, I noticed that the bathroom seemed to be filling up more slowly. Was it a good idea to try to open the door, or was I supposed to wait until help came? But the water was still rising, albeit slower. Would I be able to survive until someone came to rescue me? There was no guarantee that someone would come. I decided to do a small experiment. I took a deep breath and dived in. I turned the door handle and pushed, but the door wouldn't budge. I tried again, but no luck. I came up when I was out of breath. Obviously, the boat had sunk. The door wouldn't open because the cabin was probably full of water. I was still alive, and I wasn't giving up. But what about Julie? Until that moment, I hadn't cried, but now I started sobbing and couldn't stop. <laughs> Meanwhile, the water had risen more. What's worse, taking deep breaths while crying had used up a lot of oxygen, and I could feel there wasn't much of it left. I was in such bad shape that I couldn't tell how much time had passed. The water was now up to my chin. I was cold. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was tired and very sleepy. For a moment, I thought, let yourself go and let it all end. As a medical student, I was aware that it was hypothermia that made me think like this. I had been in cold water for a long time, so my body temperature had fallen and it was going to continue to fall. I was losing hope that help would come. We weren't in open water, but who would look for us? Neither my parents nor Julie's knew that we were here. Would Ethan's family do something? I didn't think so. I thought this was the end for me. The water continued to rise slowly. It got so high that I had to stand on my toes to avoid drowning. Just then, I heard a sound. It was like someone had hit something a few times. I held my breath. The sound stopped. Maybe there was no sound. Maybe I was hallucinating because I was about to pass out. No! I heard the sound again and this time it was closer. Anyways, if I was hallucinating, I would have heard my mom's voice or something. Why would I hear the sound of metal being hit? I dived into the water one more time. There was a soap dish made of stone. I grabbed it and came back up. I started hitting the wall with it. The other sound stopped. All you could hear was me hitting the wall. I stopped after a while. Then the sound from the outside started again. I was communicating with someone. They knew I was here. They turned out to be two divers from the search and rescue team. At first, they couldn't open the door because of the pressure. But they were there to save me. After a while, they managed to get me out of the bathroom and then out of the boat. There were doctors on the search and rescue ship. They had a lot of experience with such situations and were able to help me recover from hypothermia. As soon as I was feeling better, I asked about Julie. I found out that both she and Ethan were okay. Apparently, Ethan had diabetes, but he was too drunk to take his insulin shot. Diabetes patients lose consciousness in such situations and go into a coma after a while. Ethan somehow got himself to our cabin door and knocked. Julie helped him right away. She gave him his insulin shot, but he was still feeling very bad. Just then, the storm broke out, so he had no choice but to go upstairs. Julie went up with him, too. Thankfully, she thought of putting on their life jackets. Ethan managed to start the engine, but the waves were too big, and he couldn't prevent the boat from drifting. They fell into the water when the boat hit the rocks. 
Julie never left Ethan's side. The waves washed both of them onto the beach. Ethan had lost consciousness, so Julie couldn't leave him. The next day, a group of hikers accidentally came across them. They are both doing well now. After hearing this story, my first reaction was, they'll definitely get married after going through this together. After a horrific 36 hours, I managed to come back to life. I think I did pretty well overall. Of course, I got very lucky, but deciding to go into the bathroom, managing to stay calm, fighting the hypothermia, I definitely deserve a well done. Thanks for listening to my story. If you like stories like this, subscribe to this channel. Bye. Hi, friends. My name is Sky. I'm 17. I've never had to pay to fly somewhere on a plane. And I'll never have to. I can fly to any place in the world for free. How am I able to do that? You will find out when you hear my story. When my mom was pregnant with me, my parents were living in Africa because my dad was working there. My mom wanted to give birth in her home country. She decided to go back home a month before her due date. My dad would take some time off from work and join her there two weeks later. You might not know this, but the airline companies have a rule. You can't get on a plane if you're over 36 weeks pregnant. My mom was 35 weeks or 8 months pregnant at the time, so she was able to get on her flight without any issues. The plane took off at 6 a.m. At first, everything was going smoothly. At some point, my mom went to the restroom. There, she realized that she had some light bleeding. Of course, she panicked. She got out of the restroom and told a flight attendant about it. There were no signs of her going into labor yet, but my mom was really worried that something might happen to the baby, that is, to me. The chief flight attendant made an announcement just in case. One of our passengers is eight months pregnant. She is having some issues. Is anyone here a doctor or a nurse? She asked. When no one answered, they figured there was no health worker on board. Soon enough, their fears came true. My mom called the chief flight attendant and told her the contractions had started. That meant that she would soon be going into labor. So I had decided to come into this world a month earlier. Thankfully, the flight crew training included instructions on what to do in circumstances such as this one. They started to prepare in accordance with their instructions right away. You know, at the front part of the plane is the first class section. It's the most luxurious section of the plane, and passengers pay a lot of money to sit there. One of the most important features of the first-class seats is that they can recline up to 180 degrees. That means each seat over there can be turned into a bed. Even though there were some signs, it wasn't quite certain that labor was about to begin. But the cabin crew still had to take some precautions. They cleared the first-class section, transferring those passengers to the other part of the plane. Some of them made a fuss about it, but they had no choice because those were the rules. Then they reclined one of the seats and laid my mother down. After a while, the captain came over. We are currently above the ocean. We will be able to land in five hours. There are no health professionals on board. I know it's not up to you, but it would be great if you could hang on until we land, he said. My mom smiled. I might be able to hang on, but I don't think the little girl inside can do it because she is incredibly active right now. If you ask me, she will soon want to come out, she said. As it happened, in less than an hour, my mom's water broke, which was the most important sign that labor had begun. The flight attendants were rushing back and forth to and from first class. One of the passengers got worried that something was wrong with the plane. She called a flight attendant and asked what was going on. The attendant told her that a passenger was about to give birth at the front of the plane. She asked, is there a doctor with her? When she was told that there wasn't, she said, take me to her. I'm a gynecologist. Apparently, she was sleeping when the announcement was made. That's why she didn't know about it. This, of course, was a great surprise. But do you know what the real miracle was? This doctor was volunteering in Africa, teaching people in rural areas how to help women go through labor without medical supplies. Needless to say, this was exactly what my mom needed at that moment. When the doctor introduced herself, my mom couldn't hold back her tears because she was so scared something might happen to the baby, that is, to me. She was really relieved to hear that there was a medical specialist on board. <laughs> After examining my mom briefly, the doctor announced that labor had begun. Just like in the movies, she asked the cabin crew for stuff like hot water and a hot towel. I don't know why these things are needed during labor, but if any of you do, please let me know in the comments. 
I was born exactly two minutes later as the plane was flying at 30,000 feet. My mom always tells me, you never made me suffer during labor. I just pushed once and there you were. <laughs> The flight crew was deeply relieved when they found out that there were no complications during my birth. The captain made another announcement letting everyone know about it. We have a new passenger on board. Congratulations to both the baby and her mom, he said. Everyone was so happy. They clapped and cheered for a long time. The cabin crew offered champagne to the passengers. Even though I was born five weeks early, I was a pretty healthy baby. My mom wanted to name me after the doctor, but the doctor said, can I confess something? I never liked my own name and asked if my mom would name me Sky instead. When the plane landed, there was an ambulance waiting for me and my mom. They immediately took us to the hospital. After a series of tests, they saw that there was nothing wrong with us. Since I was born on a plane rather than in a hospital, it was the Civil Aviation Authority that gave me my birth certificate. The certificate says born aboard a plane at 30,000 feet as the place of birth, but my current passport says place of birth, the ocean, because a plane birth is very rare and it doesn't exist as an official category. So how come I can now fly around for free? It's time to tell you that part of the story. First of all, let me break it to you. It's not true that people born aboard a plane get a lifetime pass for free flights. That's a myth. In the past, some airline companies did give presents to babies born on their planes, but these consisted of a limited number of tickets. As far as I know, no one else was given an unlimited lifetime flight pass other than me. You may ask, what's so special about you? It's just luck, really. This man you see on the screen is the general manager of the company that owns the plane on which I was born. He is an incredibly nice person. He calls me on my birthday every year without exception. This lovely general manager and his wife weren't able to conceive for a long time. They were going through treatments for years, but nothing was working. Thankfully, his wife finally got pregnant. The rest is really interesting. This woman and my mom gave birth at the same time, down to the minute. So their daughter was born in the hospital and me on the plane at the same moment. The man was very moved by this when he found out. It can't just be a coincidence that a baby was born aboard one of our planes at the exact same time as my daughter. This is definitely a small miracle. I can't just ignore that. I want to give the baby from the plane a lifetime flight pass. But they decided to keep it a secret to prevent it from becoming part of the company policy. Otherwise, they would have to give the same present for every in-flight birth. If you noticed, I didn't say the name of the airline because they made me sign a non-disclosure agreement. You're probably curious about how much I've been taking advantage of this incredible opportunity. It wasn't much use to me when I was younger. I wasn't able to travel on my own at that age. I had to be accompanied by at least one of my parents. Since they didn't have access to free tickets, they had to pay for flights. However, since last year, I've started to fly by myself, and this has completely changed my life. We played a game to make my first solo flight unforgettable. My mom got me a globe. They blindfolded me. My dad spun the globe, and I stopped it by putting my finger on a random spot. Obviously, I was so curious to see what I chose. When I opened my eyes, I was thrilled. The spot I pointed to was Denmark, and this was one of the countries I wanted to see the most. This is how I ended up flying to Copenhagen on the first free flight I took on my own. So far, apart from Copenhagen, I've only been able to travel by myself once more. That was a domestic flight. I went to visit my grandmother for her 75th birthday and came back the same night. It made me so happy to be able to make my grandmother's day. I'm already planning the trips I'm going to take in the future. I made a list of places I want to see the most. Of course, it's only my flight that is free. I have to pay for everything else. I need to have some money in my pocket, even if I'm staying at the cheapest places possible. This is why I'm always saving part of my allowance. Next year, I will go to Japan. If I have any money left, I also want to go to Cuba. Every birth story is special, but mine is truly amazing. I wanted to share it because I thought you might find it interesting. I hope you liked it. Thanks for listening to me. If you like stories like this, you can subscribe to this channel now. That way you will know when new videos come out. Bye! Hi guys, my name is Nora. I have a very rare genetic condition. When I tell you what it is, you might find it appealing. You might even wish you had it. But once you hear the whole story, you'll know that it's not something to wish for. That's because reaching my age with this condition is considered unusually successful.
The formal name of my condition is congenital insensitivity to pain. It means that I don't feel pain. I don't feel any aches either. For example, if someone stands on my foot, I won't feel it. It doesn't hurt if you stick a needle in my arm. I never get headaches. It doesn't hurt if I accidentally cut myself while making food. When you hear all this, it sounds like a superpower, but it really isn't like that. Pain and aches are vital for our health. Let me tell you about something that happened last year. One evening, I got out of the shower. I realized my skin was all red when I was drying my hair. It turns out that the water was too hot when I was showering. I didn't notice it because I didn't feel any pain. I had second degree burns on my back, my arms, my neck. The next day, I had blisters everywhere. If I could feel pain, I would have felt that the water was too hot and I wouldn't have been burned. As you can see, feeling pain helps us protect ourselves. We are too vulnerable without it. This is a bit embarrassing, but let me tell you something interesting. I can't feel it when I have to pee. So I always go to the bathroom at the same time every day. My body is used to it now. If I don't follow the schedule, I don't feel anything, even when my bladder is about to burst. I can only tell when I start peeing myself. So I set alarms to remind myself to go to the bathroom. I know it's a bit gross, but I wanted to make sure you understand my situation. So if I don't know when I need to pee, does that mean I don't feel hunger? Luckily, that's not a problem. Hunger and feeling full is controlled by a different mechanism in the body. So I can feel it when I'm hungry or when I get full when I'm eating. I feel especially lucky that I can feel fullness. Otherwise, I would eat all the time and gain too much weight. A problem I might have in the future is about giving birth. Women can tell that they're about to give birth because of the pain they feel. As you can guess, people like me don't feel such pain either. That might sound good to you as well. What more do you want? You can give birth without pain, you might say. However, a mother has to push in order to give birth. But if you can't feel labor pain from the contractions, you don't know that you need to push. So I probably won't be able to give birth naturally. I'll have to give birth with a C-section. That's the future, though. I actually want to talk more about what I'm going through now. You know what the most common problem I have in my daily life is? Biting the inside of my cheek when eating. You don't do it as often as I do, because you know that it will hurt based on your past experiences. I've never felt pain, so I don't have that experience. That's why I often bite my cheek or tongue when eating. Sometimes I end up with a mouth full of blood. So I have to stop eating and wash my mouth. That's actually how I was diagnosed. When my teeth first came out, I started eating my tongue. I kept biting it so my mouth was always filled with blood. When my mom told the doctor, he said this wasn't normal at all. They didn't know what was wrong at first because it's such a rare condition. Then they ran some tests. They figured it out when they realized that I don't feel pain. My mom always says that for her, the hardest part was when I was a baby. For example, I would be taking an afternoon nap, then my mom would see that my eyes were all purple when I woke up. Turns out I was pressing too hard when rubbing my eyes. I still have a lot of problems today, but at least my parents don't have to deal with it. So many things happened when I was in primary school. You're too young to protect yourself at that age. For example, I really wanted to skate. I begged her, but of course my mom didn't get me rollerblades. So one day, I borrowed my friend's rollerblades and went skating. When I came home, my left arm was hanging really low. I had fallen on it when I was skating. I didn't feel any pain, so I didn't know that it was broken. So I kept on skating as if nothing had happened and fell on it a second time. If I remember correctly, I broke my arm in six places. Usually it takes one month for a broken bone to heal in kids, but I had to wear a cast for four months. Around that age, another crazy thing happened. I always used to have bruises all over my body and a bandage on my arm, my leg, and even my head. One of the neighbors noticed this. She watched me for a while. She thought that there must be violence in my home for me to have so many bruises. 
and called the cops. Two social workers came to our home. My parents showed the doctor's report, so everything was okay. It's kind of tragic, but we laugh about it whenever we talk about it. I've mentioned all the downsides. Are there any benefits to not feeling pain? Maybe, but I've never explored them. Remember when it was super trendy to eat the world's spiciest pepper on YouTube? Those videos got millions of views. People made a lot of money like this. If I wanted to, I could have eaten the spiciest pepper in the galaxy. I could have been a guest on a YouTube channel without telling anyone about my condition. Wow. I could have even started my own channel after I got famous as a guest. I would have made a ton of money. <laughs> I'm just joking. Don't let this video fool you. I don't really like being in front of the camera. Anyway, I don't want to make money out of something that makes my life really hard. I read somewhere that a guy in India makes a living because of this condition. He performs on the streets, sticking skewers in his body, walking on fire, and letting cars drive over his feet. Even though he doesn't feel pain, these are all really risky. He could easily harm himself. People like me live lives of danger. Why make it more dangerous with stunts like this? Unfortunately, people with my condition have a short lifespan. I've already told you so many things, so now you're aware of it too. At any time, I could go through any one of hundreds of issues. Like a heart attack. Heart attacks have some signs. If you feel chest pain, you know that you need to go to a hospital straight away. So the doctors can intervene before you have a heart attack. I wouldn't be able to do that. I wouldn't feel any chest pain, so I would only know that I was having a heart attack once it actually began. But there is one thing about my condition that I am grateful for. I don't have to go through period pains. My mom has terrible period pains. Her pains begin days before her period and they continue for days. If I could feel pain, I'm pretty sure I'd suffer like my mom. Thankfully, I don't have to worry about that. The other thing that I really like is that I don't ever get itchy. Some people with this condition don't feel itchiness either. I'm one of those people. I have never scratched an itch to this day. No matter how many mosquitoes bite me, I don't itch. Even if the bitten area gets red or swollen, I never feel like scratching it. It's funny though because mosquitoes love me. If there are 10 people in a room, I'm the one they'll bite. If I could feel itching, then I'd be in big trouble. I guess this is how the negative parts kind of get balanced. The more I tell you about the advantages of my condition, the more I remember. Like, I don't sweat, even when it's really hot. What does that have to do with pain, you might wonder? You're right. But for some reason, people with this condition don't sweat. So I don't have to think if I smell bad. I've never spent money on deodorant in my life. My doctor has been following my condition for years now. One day he said, the only pain you'll ever go through is heartbreak. But I haven't fallen in love yet. I know it's really stupid, but I dream of falling in love with someone and I want that person to leave me so that I can experience heartbreak like my doctor said. I've read about it online and many people say that heartbreak feels like physical pain. This is the only chance I have to experience pain. Who knows, maybe I will eventually experience it. Lastly, I must talk about this. Is there a cure for this condition? Sadly, no. But we do know the reasons and circumstances under which it's seen. So it might be possible to find a cure. However, only a few people in the world have the condition. The exact number isn't known, but it's probably less than 500. For pharmaceutical companies, fewer patients means less money. So nobody puts aside financial resources to find the cure. You know, the cure to many conditions is found through scientific research. It takes years for that research to become medicine. Maybe they'll find something in the future, but there's nothing now. Thank you for listening to me. Now you know my entire story. Now tell me, would you like to be in my position? Please tell me in the comments what you think. If you want to watch interesting stories about people, subscribe to the channel. 
If you have an interesting story, email it to us. Our email address is linked in the description box. Bye!